This is the 23rd of May 2006. We're in Tarragona with Christiana Nord. Christiana, you're noted as a translator, trainer, and theorist within the school that's known as Scopos Theory. Does that label fit to you? Are you a theorist of Scopos? Well, in a way, I think I am, although I myself, I prefer um, the term functionalist because, um, of course, I'm drawing on Scopos' theory, but I'm not really a theorist. Uh, myself, I'm an, uh, a person who applies the theory and... Uh, since I'm applying, uh, I'm applying Scopos theory to translator training, translation teaching, and also to practical translation work, I think I'm a functionalist. Does that mean you're one of a group of people, or, or do you see yourself as, as, a, as working off your own bat? <laughs> In a way, yes, probably. Uh, although I would see myself in the same group with, for example, uh, Paul Kussmaul mm -hmm. and the late Hans Hönig and uh, others. Good. Justa Holtz Mentory or Hans Vermeer? Hans Vermeer and Justa Holtz Mentory are somewhere in the back of my mind. Um, but as I said, being an applicator, um, I introduced a loyalty into the Scopos concept and I think that's important for application. Uh, perhaps it's not so important mm -hmm. for the general theory, but of course I've learned a lot from both Hans Vermeer and Justa Hans Mentor. So let's get down to your basic ideas. What, what do you mean by loyalty in that sense? Well, you see, um, radical functionalism, a radical Scopos theory would um, allow, as I see it, um, for any Scopos with a given source text and the translation would be functional as long as it achieves the Scopos um, intended by the client so or whoever, the, the aim, good. the goal, yeah. the intended purpose, say. And uh, since um, when I'm training young students to be translators in the real world, they can't just pretend they are um, acting somewhere in the, in the void, but uh, they have to take um, account of the ideas and concepts of translation prevailing in their respective, in the cultures they're working uh, with. And this is precisely what loyalty does. It, it is a way of um, considering what the prospective receivers of the translation might expect of the translation and how they're going to receive it. Uh, it does not mean that uh, you always have to do what they expect, but uh, that you have to um, be aware of it and, uh, if necessary, kind of uh, make them aware that you are doing perhaps a different thing from what they expect you to it's do. So loyalty to, to people. The norms or to, to people? To people. Loyalty right. is an interpersonal category. I, I would like to insist on this. It's not loyalty with regard to texts, because our texts are kind of utterances of people, and people have rights, and um, that's an ethical question, of course. And uh, I, it's a loyalty towards um, the client, towards the um, target text receivers, also towards the source text author, if there is any person, if it's not an anonymous text, so mm -hmm. to speak, and of course the loyalty uh, towards myself as a tra translator, so I can sleep uh, <laughs> okay. well at night after doing my translation work. Would that be your main um, recommendation when you're training translators now, or 
Do you emphasize other features as well? No, of course, I emphasize the functional viewpoint, but which, I, which means what? Then? Which functional. means um, try and find out if you don't get an explicit translation brief. Try and find out what the client needs, thinks he or she needs, and then. Uh, try to produce, produce um, a text that uh, achieves precisely these purposes, mm -hmm. the purposes intended by the client, if they are compatible with what you think your ethos, uh, your professional uh, ethics are. Um, and uh, with regard to ethics, I wouldn't uh, like to impose my own ethics on the students, uh, but I make a point of telling them that they should uh, make up their minds uh, where their uh, point of departure is and how far they would go, and that they please uh, make up their minds at the beginning of the month and not <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the month, where sometimes ethics turn a little bit more flexible <laughs> if you don't know how to pay the rent the next month. Do you think that gives a very conservative approach to translation, or is that a misreading? No, I don't think that's very conservative. Yeah. Um, I think it's quite modern um, because the conservative, as I see it, the conservative approach would be uh, that the source text tells you how it wants to be translated, as uh, my head of department used to put it a uh, long, long, long time ago. I've never talked, uh, I've never heard a source text telling me how it wanted to, to, to be translated, and my own experience is that it is sometimes even impossible uh, to uh, produce anything like an equivalent in a target culture, especially when the source and the target cultures are very far apart uh, or if, uh, with the historical texts like Bible texts, etc. There is no such thing as an equivalent of the, say, of the um, addressed audience uh, of St. Paul uh, when he wrote the letter okay. to the Corinthians. Not even functional equivalent. Not, not even functional right. equivalent, okay. because the, the audience is so different and has such a different um, background, knowledge, situation, etc. So uh, even if they could read uh, the text in the original, uh, not being theologians, for example, they would read it in a different way. Mm. Good. I, I'd like now to go back. Mm -hmm. uh, to where you started off with your yeah. work in translation studies. Uh, what were you doing or where mm -hmm. were you when you were about 25? Yeah, where? Oh, that's a long, 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 ten, long years ago. Ago. 10 years ago, more or less. Okay, I finished my um, training uh, at the University of Heidelberg when I was 24. And my uh, teacher then, Katharina Reis, asked me whether I wanted to go into teaching. So I said, oh, how wonderful, and uh, started teaching. So when I was 25, I had about one year I'd been teaching for a year, trying, struggling to find my way in teaching. There was no such thing as translation theory then. And the only thing I could do was um, imitating the teachers I had liked best. Um, um, Sometimes, yeah, finding, groping for my own way in the, <laughs> in the mist. And it was only until very, very much later that I started to kind of develop my own methodology. And you, you remained in the university, the German I, university system. Yes, I remained there. I never, earned, I never learned, earned a living translating. <laughs> Is, is that a problem, do you think? For a teacher? Yes. Uh, well, I think um, it, it, it would be a good thing if uh, teachers had both um, a theoretical and a practical uh, experience of translation. But at the time, uh, yeah, it was either get this job or perhaps sure. not yeah. find one. Yeah. And um, I love teaching, and even in some moments of my long teaching career when I was very disappointed and thought of giving all this up, um, and people even offered me um, a job in a big um, company, 
uh, to be a translator or even supervisors and I just thought about it for two minutes and I thought mm. I don't think I want to be this um, I don't think I would be a good supervisor for practical uh, translation because I'm a teacher um, by heart and soul and I think it, I wouldn't make a good good uh, reviser in a, in a company. Although I've done a bit of practical translation work, it's not that I never did this, but always uh, uh, sort of on a, on a side track. Your, your academic career has had lots of movements. Yeah. From, from Heidelberg. Yeah, I stayed... PhD uh, in Vienna. Uh, no, or? PhD in Heidelberg, in, in Heidelberg, fact. Uh, Heidelberg was the longest right. stay. And, um, of course, uh, a typical uh, feminine career. I had two children. I <laughs> raised two children. And uh, until... Um, the little one uh, was about to go to school. I didn't just have any time, and, and, and I had no uh, uh, moment, free moment to think about this. I, I don't think I even was interested. And Katharina Reis used to be very disappointed because, in <laughs> her mind, she had thought I would go straight into um, academic research. Uh, which at the time hardly existed, but she never told me. And we yeah. only talked about this very much later <laughs> when she said, oh, I was so disappointed that you didn't, and then you, then you had two children. And I said, oh, well, yes, I'm glad I had these children. And afterwards, there was time enough to, to do all the things I did. Uh, I think it had, I had to mature, really. I was but very young. But you produced a string of books? But only afterwards, only later, okay. because okay. the first book was, uh, came out, the text analysis book came out in, in 88. So I had been teaching for 20 years then. So, and, and it grew out of my teaching, and I think that's important um, for the evaluation of my work, that it has always been very close to my teaching. Do you think that your approach to translation has encountered opposition within academic circles? Oh yes, it has. Sure. Uh, in Germany more than anywhere else, but this is a an old story uh, too. <laughs> a very old story too. No, but I think in Germany, uh, not only because of uh, this, but also because of the situation of translation studies still in Germany. Uh, in Germany, Translation had always be, been part of the uh, philog philological studies and uh, future language teachers had to translate in their um, um, studies or in their uh, training. So philologists used to say, what are you doing, what we have been doing for the past 200 years? So translation um, theory found it very difficult to sort of develop into a discipline, and a recognized discipline of its own, and I'm not sure whether it has in Germany really been recognized in the meantime. Really? Really. And you don't think you created the no. new orthodoxy? No, <laughs> no, I don't think I did. Then this, of course, has got something to do with my situation. When I left Heidelberg, I uh, went to Vienna for a year and a half uh, to teach there, and then I went to Hildesheim for two years to teach there. But I, uh, uh, and then only very late, when I was uh, 53, I got this chair in Magdeburg. And Magdeburg is a uh, university of applied sciences uh, with no right to do PhDs. So this is why I never had... Um, doctoral students of my own and only of my own. I had doctoral students, but always in cooperation uh, with uh, traditional universities, colleagues at traditional universities within Germany or abroad in, in Brazil, in Spain, uh, in other countries, no problem. But in Germany, I think the situation is different. And we had so much trouble to find, to cover the posts we can offer at our university. We, we just require 
people, people to have a, a PhD in something closely related to translation, which might be terminology or something, plus um, practical experience. And, uh, and it was ever so hard to find people. Okay. Hmm? Obvious question then, perhaps. What remains to be done in translation studies? What do you think? Everything. <laughs> no, no, no I think, no, again. no. When, when people ask me this question and um, say what remains to be done or what do you think about the um, present stage of uh, translation studies, I think, judging from the function on this corner, I think what we need now is a an empirical phase mm -hmm. mm, yep. to prove or um, uh, correct the uh, theoretical ideas, to verify or falsify them and find out how much of this is actually done in yeah. practice, not only in literary uh, translation because uh, there's hardly any functionalism there, but in in professional translation of speci specialized texts in the EU or in companies uh, or by freelancers, etc. So I think we need quite a lot of studies then. I yeah. think the field is open for research. Uh, no problem to find <laughs> research topics here. Um, but this has to be done before anybody starts on some new uh, theoretical idea. Great, Christiane Nord, thank you very much. You're welcome.